Welcome back, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Khan Kao, and I am an emergency uh, medicine physician. Uh, today, I am joined by rheumatologist uh, Dr. Martina Zingenbein. Welcome, Dr. Zingenbein. Thank you, Dr. Kao, for having me. Um, thank you for uh, volunteering your time and uh, expertise uh, to help medical students and other students uh, learning uh, what a rheumatologist does, and hopefully it, uh, it may change one person's uh, lives and their decision. Of course, it's my pleasure. Yes, uh, so Dr. Zingenbein has 15, almost 15 years of experience as a rheumatologist. Uh, so uh, students, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find this uh, uh, very valuable. Uh, so we'll start off with the first questions. Um, uh, with, your, uh, with your background um, and, uh, and how you uh, end up choosing to be a rheumatologist. Of course, thank you. I'm originally from Slovakia and I moved to the United States in 2001. Uh, so right before 9-11. Um, and I, so I came here after medical school. I came here to uh, pursue internal medicine residency. I wanted, I knew that I wanted to pursue residency in the United States due to the quality of uh, mm -hmm. training. And when I came, my, my mind was set on cardiology at the time. However, mm -hmm. um, one of the first core lectures we had as residents was with uh, Dr. Goldberg, who is a rheumatologist. And I will never forget how he started the lecture. He said, you have a patient and he comes and she reports some pain to you. What do you do? And people started shooting like, oh, you'll order ANA or you, you order this test. And he says, no, you will talk to the person and then you examine them. And I'm like, wow, like, yes, start from the basics. And I said, I, I said to myself, this is, I want to be like this. Like, I want to be a doctor who talks to people and examines them. And basically, um, that's where it started initially. And then I did a rotation in rheumatology in my first year and second year. And I was hooked. Mm, awesome. Uh, and can you uh, give us a, a brief description what a rheumatologist does? Of course. Yes. Yeah. So a rheumatologist is a physician who evaluates people with musculoskeletal issues and autoimmune conditions. Um, other diagnoses that fall under rheumatology are vasculitis or relapsing polychondritis. So anything and everything inflammatory or autoimmune that pertains to muscles, tendons, ligaments, and connective tissue, that's rheumatology. And then we also deal with non-inflammatory conditions such as osteoarthritis or fibromyalgia. So it's a very fairly wide field um, and encompasses a lot of musculoskeletal conditions. Awesome, awesome. And uh, you talked about uh, how you thought you wanted to be a cardiologist. Uh, yes. <laughs> what, uh, what, you mean, and that decision, uh, the one course and then rotations, were there any other um, specialties you thought you wanted to do and uh, what made you yeah. decide on rheumatology? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. So I was interested in cardiology because as a medical student, I did a rotation in cardiology when I was, I was doing an exchange in, as a lab uh, medical student in, at mm. Mayo Clinic. And at, at the end of my stay there, I did a clinical rotation on the uh, with medic medical residents, internal medicine residents, and I did cardiology uh, for two weeks, and it was just so fascinating. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know exactly what changed. As a resident, I basically it, the cardiology I was exposed to um, was very procedural or like electrophysiology. I could not even pronounce some you know names of the diagnosis or the procedures that the patients mm -hmm. with cardiac conditions and I'm like I I really don't want that and I and I knew I was not a procedural proceduralist mm -hmm. I just knew that was not my uh, forte and uh, I basically that kind of died off slowly and mm -hmm. as I mentioned I was uh, attracted to specialties that you had to think and rheumatology you have to do a little bit of investigation but you also do get to do procedures with the joint aspiration Mm -hmm. aspirations and injections and then there is a big field uh, evolving of musculoskeletal ultrasound so those who are interested in doing their own imaging study they can get certification in ultrasound which I also did did but I didn't I don't do it as often or I don't do it as a part of my regular practice I only use ultrasound because my colleagues have it who 
uh, we share office with, and they I use it to to help localize joint injection fairly infrequently. Mm. Mm. Uh, and for students who don't know, uh, rheumatology is a fellowship, correct? Yes. Yeah, so you do first intro medicine residency, which is three years, and then you do um, rheumatology fellowship. General rheumatology fellowship is two years. And after that, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do still with myself. So I did additional year of lupus fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. So that's always an option to do something, to do an extra year of uh, additional academic, um, academia-based fellowship, or you can go into practice after two years of general rheumatology. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, and what are uh, the typical, or I guess I'll repeat that. What are the qualities and characteristics of a, a uh, to be successful as a rheumatologist? Yes, thank you for that question. So I kind of already alluded to it a little bit. You mm -hmm. do have to um, have a knack or you have to like kind of investigation type of interviewing um, um, pattern because in rheumatology one of the hallmarks of rheumatology which I also like about rheumatology is that you don't just look at foot or like skin like dermatologists do you look at the whole person you do have to mm -hmm. ask questions about multiple organ system in order to then um, come to um, your clinical impression so you have to be willing to ask questions and listen for answers. It's not just a checklist like this. Do you have this, 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 and then you do algorithms. Yes, you do follow algorithms, but in clinical practice, it's really more about gaining the information, getting the information out mm -hmm. of the patient. So the second, so investigative type of skills. And then second is patience. Like you, you have to be willing to first uh, sit with the patient to tell you the story and then patients mm -hmm. with, um, finding the answer sometimes you don't have the diagnosis right away it can take weeks to sometimes months because mm -hmm. that's the nature of some rheumatic conditions they evolve over time and uh, compassion but i i think that compassion is for every specialty in my opinion every physician should be compassionate uh and um yeah okay awesome uh thank you for that and uh <clears throat> It seems like you're very passionate about rheumatology. What are uh, some of the most exciting aspects uh, of uh, being a rheumatologist? Yes, so uh, I think there are a few. Um, it kind of has to do with what I said about what mm -hmm. the qualities. So you have to be curious, you have to be patient, you have to be a little bit of investigator. Mm -hmm. I love the stories. I love to um, hear about patients story so because that's what that's what connects you to the person and that's what makes you remember them mm -hmm. uh if i only do a checklist of questions like i i don't know like to give an example i had a procedure recently and i went to pre-op area and you know the person asked me questions and it was a forgettable experience right they were all nice but it you don't remember them after a couple of days they don't remember you because it's just a checklist, a checklist of questions. When you connect with somebody, they tell you their story, they tell you um, background of how the symptoms evolve. And um, to me, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And it gives you um, perspective of how some people got to where they are and how much they suffered and how much you can help them. So that the storytelling and receiving the story is exciting. And the second part is we do the proceduralist part that we do injections and procedures you know that makes it kind of exciting on the hands-on level mm -hmm. and um the third part is uh the ability to listen to a story and look for clues and details also can give you edge in terms of so we i get a i get a quite a few second opinions mm -hmm. and um and even if it's not a second opinion, I, I remember fairly early on in my career, I got a patient from the emergency room, actually, that was referred as uh, temporal arthritis, which is a dangerous diagnosis, right? Like you can lose eyesight, you can even die. And after I examined the patient, I realized she had a murmur and um, nobody, heart murmur, and nobody, that was not mentioned in the, in the notes from the ER. Mm -hmm. So that was a first clue that something was off. And then she told me, 
she was having the headache. But then in the course of interview, it became uh, clear that she had a headache, but she also had um, like um, herpes zoster mm-hmm. lesions, you know, from um, the infection. And it turned out this patient had um, subacute bacterial endocarditis and the origin of the bacteria was from the skin infection from like secondary infection of the lesions on the scalp from herpes zoster so it but her stat rate was elevated yes but it was not because she had temple arthritis and if i didn't listen and didn't stop to think that something was off i would have given her steroids and she could have died and instead she had echo then she was um seen by cardiology and she ended up having surgery because of the I think it was mitral valve that was infected. Yeah. So um, like it, that detective part of it is really, you know, exciting and it can change a person's life or course of illness. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a fantastic uh, clinical uh, patient uh, changing their, their, uh, their care and essentially saving, saving a patient's lives. Uh, I didn't feel like that I, like that at the time, but it yeah. was to me. I was like, yeah, I didn't just go with what was written in the chart, but you know, stopping and thinking what and doing the exam. I did what this Dr. Goldberg yes. back in my residency, what he taught us to do: like talk to the patient first, examine them, and then start ordering labs and treating the patient. So that's why it's really hard to, in my opinion, that's why it was hard to do uh, telehealth medicine during pandemic for new patients and even established ones, because yes, you can get a lot of information from persons via Zoom, like we are talking now, and you can get a clue, but there is nothing that, in my opinion, that is nothing that um, th- that is superior to meeting the person in, uh, in real life, in person and examining them. Like that gives you a uh, really important piece of information. Awesome, thank you. And I've, so on the other uh, spectrum from the exciting aspect, what are the frustrating aspects of being a rheumatologist that students should know? Well, I'm <laughs> like current, like you mean in job currently? Yeah, currently in the past or what your colleagues uh, think about it as well. I, I think as a specialty, we are well-respected. I don't have really concerns about that. I do struggle a lot sometimes with prior authorizations. Um, mm-hmm. Prior authorization is when a patient uh, needs a medication and it's not like it's more expensive medication or uh, not on the formulary. And you have to do a prior, author- you have to fill out a form for the patient to uh, in order to justify the use of the medication. And it's extremely frustrating at times when this medication is approved by FDA. It's, uh, we use it for that condition and the insurance says, no, it's like, you have to use this, 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 and this first. And at times it's literally, you are scratching your head going, this is not in the best interest of the patient. Like why, why is the insurance company doing that? And this is honestly the most uh, frustrating part. We talk about it on our forums, the Facebook uh, groups that we are in. This is kind of the plight of every rheumatologist who is who is taking insurance, who does, uh, and actually those who don't take insurance too, they have to still help their patients get the uh, mm-hmm. medication. So that, if we could change that as a, as a, as a healthcare, that would be great. Um, trying to think of, Another frustrating part or not as attractive is that when you are employed and I am now and it has come up is that you are, unless you negotiate something better, which that's the only regret I have about my current position. I didn't negotiate a better rate. Basically, Mm -hmm. you are reduced to a number and you have to see a certain amount of patients per day, per week um, in order to get paid. There is this thing called um, work RVUs, WRVU. And um, based on how many you accumulate per day, per week, per month, like that's what is the salary assigned to you. And it's very sad because as I said, I feel reduced to a number and I'm trying to uh, make a decision right now about whether 
I'm just going to accept what is or whether I'm going to go different routes. So I'm being very honest here yes. that this is, uh, this can, th this may not be the most pleasant part. I have never, I never really felt I needed or I wanted that much for salary. I'm on the lower end. I have to say I have, I do have a six digit salary, but I'm on the very lowest end of the spectrum. And uh, because of the cost of living here, it is um, becoming a little difficult for me to be happy with my salary. So um, that's something to consider when, um, and not necessarily to deter you from going into your specialty. I think uh, American healthcare needs rheumatology is really bad. We need more trainees. So I actually want to encourage people to go into rheumatology. However, negotiate, that would be my advice for them. Uh, look where you're moving to look what the cost of living is and negotiate for yourself the best you can and they can email me or contact contact me after that there, there is actually a good podcast don't even bother contacting me because I'm not good at it obviously since I didn't negotiate well for myself there is a Dr. Linda Street has a podcast um, and I forget how it's called oh sorry um I think simply worth it it's called simply worth it mm -hmm. and it's brilliant in terms of teaching um physicians and medical students there is never too early to start learning how to negotiate for the best deal for yourself uh yeah that's fantastic I, and uh and I'll put a I'll put the link to, uh, to the podcast yes uh, below as well and I I agree with you I think the one of the best advice I got in residency was uh, know your your self worth, uh, and and understand the market, and so that way you can negotiate what you want, um, even if the market demand may be uh, low and uh, or yeah, uh, demand may be low and supply be, may be high, but uh, you'll you'll have to understand your self worth and uh, and and take whatever contract that you want. Right. Or if they are not willing to budge, be willing to walk away. Like um, it's always good to have leverage that leverage that. So you have more than one option. Uh, and I was not uh, savvy enough in that situation. I really wanted to come to Cape Cod. I was wanting it so bad that I took a pay cut, a huge pay cut. Um, and I, I can't say that it's not worth it because I love living here. Like to be able to go to the ocean um, you know, when after I come back from work and just sit and listen to the waves, it's it's priceless. But it was not like that in the winter, okay. <laughs> you know. So winter was very hard because it's really cold and dreary. And I was having all those uh, thoughts about how I did not do good enough job and all that stuff. So I'm working on that. And I I as I said, I I may not stay uh, if I'm not able to negotiate um, better deal for myself. Yeah. Understood. Understood. Well, good luck with uh, with that uh, process. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, so let's uh, this will segue into uh, like work life uh, integration or balance. That's how some view it. Uh, how does uh, being a rheumatologist uh, affect uh, uh, regarding work life integration? How much do you wor work and and whatnot? Right. So thank you for that question. So uh, my situation is different from most of uh, individuals or my colleagues uh, in that I'm a single mom. So mm -hmm. I have to consider my and you know my needs first. Be like my, my colleagues work full time, um, and I choose not to. I I'm seventy five percent, and that's so that I can have the work life balance. Work life balance you're talking about. I want to be able to go to gym before I pick up my son. My son is five currently. He's still in daycare, mm -hmm. um, and I want to be able to do stuff for myself before I pick him up. And if I worked for a full time, I wouldn't be able to. So. I work every day, but I'm done at three. And then I have, you know, a couple of hours before I have to pick him up. Um, so that was my choice to prevent burnout because I did work uh, full time until he was born basically. And that just, um, um, that's, you ask about I, uh, what is another part about my specialty that I'm not excited about. And that's the documentation, but it doesn't mean that you cannot Good. I'm getting better and better at it. And by documentation, I mean charting. So getting all the notes done before I go home is like my new priority. And I'm really, I'm 90% there. But then the other part is the inbox, which means 
messages from nurses, messages from patients. So patients have a protected portal, but the messages come to you. So answering those, then the refill prescriptions, then those prioritizations, as I told you, that's that's all part of inbox. And that is kind of my headache. And it's, we again, that's another part we talk about the inbox, how to take care of that and not to take it home. I did make a rule. Basically, I don't take work home. That's And that's really good to set that boundary early on. Because mm-hmm. if you don't, you'll find yourself working. And I did that. I did make a mistake. I found myself getting up at six o'clock or 5.30 to work on charts from home yet before I get to work, then working all day and then working at home and at night. It was a nightmare. So that's why, so the setting the boundary, work is work and home is home is super important. It's not always possible. And there are, there is a little bit of overlap. So when I'm on call, I have, when I take home from, uh, when I take call from home, obviously I have to look at the chart and I have to chart, but it's not that bad. It's only one week a month. And Mm. the rest of the month, I don't take stuff home. So if stuff that doesn't get done, it will have to wait until tomorrow. So you have to learn or uh, advice for the humans going into rheumatology. Yes, you have to learn how to prioritize and triage. So there are some things you need to and want to take care of the day off. But if, if there are things that can wait, they will have to wait. And it's the end of the day. And, you know, you can't you don't have any more time left it has to wait until the next day. And that's my rule. And um, it works most of the time. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting how well, one of the highest burnt out uh, factor is the documentation, the EMR aspect and uh, bringing work home. And, and I've approached it uh, ever since um, residency is uh, how do I learn from the most efficient person at work who's able to, who's able to at home without uh, any task any task done and I just and I just approach them ask them how do you do it and then I just try to try to try to apply that apply to, that to, to my aspect of work so that way I I mean there's uh, there's EM physicians that uh, that document at home I just refuse to do that. Very, Very good. good. It was brilliant, by the way, to learn from people who know how to do it. I get an echo. Are you getting echo too? Uh, no, I am not. Uh, okay, I don't. Any, I don't right now. It was weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, that aspect. Uh, was there anything else you uh, you wanted to add uh, regarding the, uh, regarding that question? A work-life balance, yeah, I think the boundaries that is so important for everyone to establish early on because you, or when I say you, like the person who um, is the physician who is seeing patients, we are the only people who can determine what is the best way for us to, you know, to deal with the inbox and work like that work-life balance. And if we don't put like the line in the sand, like this is it, like I'm not doing that, People don't care. They will walk all over us if we don't set the boundary. And that has been my experience very consistently. And don't, people don't necessarily do it with maliciousness. Mm-hmm. But basically, administration, they ask you to do this and this and this. Nurses, don't, they, don't, you know, they don't necessarily know that you're done at 4 or whatever, 3.30. And they will send messages to you. And you have to say, this is it. 3 o'clock or 3.30, I'm done. If the person has any urgent message or anything urgent, they have to call an on-call physician. That may be you that week or that day, right? But on days when you're not on call, you are in charge. Like it's your job to say, this is my work. This is my after work. And I don't take, I don't mesh, I don't mix them up. And it starts and ends with us, really. It's up to us to teach our staff and our employer what you know what we consider unacceptable or what we consider acceptable Mm -hmm. thank you and this is a a different question not so much uh for um choosing career but more or less for the international medical students Mm -hmm. Uh, you said that you did medical school in uh, slovakia right do you have any tips for students with the international medical school to get into the the medical programs yes thank you for that question so um if they have a chance to get um 
hands-on experience, clinical experience in the United States, if they want to get to United States, that's what I would recommend. I was lucky enough to, as I said, I went to Mayo Clinic as a medical student to do research in lab, but then at the end of it, I was able to do four weeks. So I was there for 11 months. And then the 12 months, the four weeks, I was able to do clinical rotation, two weeks cardiology, two, week, two weeks internal medicine. And that was invaluable in then in my further effort to get into residency because I got the I got two providers to set, to write me letters of recommendation, which were highly regarded as part of the uh, residency application process. So that I really do recommend any type, but any type of clinical experience is good, obviously. Mm-hmm. And the more, the better. And if they can get some way of doing clinical clerkship as a medical student in the United States, that would be the best. So mm-hmm. that, um, um, and then as far as um, the visa, so once I, w- the residency I was accepted to, mm-hmm. they had, so the residency has to accept the J-1 visa because that's what the, at least that's what I was on. I don't know how it is now, to be honest. It's, that was, you know, 15, 18 years ago, mm-hmm. but I, I was on J-1 visa and the residency has to be fluid and fluent, I should say fluent in, in dealing with um, mm. foreign medical graduates. So yeah, that, that's that's another chapter in its own to be a, an FMG in, in the US healthcare system. But yeah, um, it was a lot of paperwork. Like I had to submit paperwork to my Ministry of Healthcare in, in my country. I had to go to the embassy. Like it was uh, difficult even before 9-11 and after 9-11, every time I traveled, I had to go to the embassy of the United States in Slovakia. So people have to know uh, what is what are the requirements, but in terms of what increases their chances of getting into residency, in my opinion, is getting clinical experience in the United States, even just a couple of weeks, if mm-hmm. they can come and have a clinical rotation with somebody who can give them recommendation from American healthcare system. Awesome, uh, thank you for that. I, I wholeheartedly agree that uh, to get your foot in the door somehow, uh, within the uh, the American system of uh, clinical training and just knowing somebody to to help you advance further. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, now, so uh, I the next question I have is, you know, I mean, with COVID nineteen, how has rheumatology changed uh, in practice pattern? And and then the second aspect, uh, hopefully COVID will be gone soon. Uh, who know, who knows? Um, is the future outlook of rheumatology 10 to 20 years down the road? Okay, so I kind of alluded to my a uh, little bit of frustration, but there were many positive things, or at least a few for sure. So one main positive thing is that people who did not need to come in to the office, who let's say uh, I saw them once for the first mm-hmm. visit, and then we just needed to discuss the results and plan of care, Mm-hmm. That's a perfect way to take mm-hmm. care of on Zoom, right? Because you don't need to physically touch them. You're just explaining things. And it was very good that the healthcare, healthcare insurance has started to pay for this, even if it was a phone call. You, mm-hmm. um, one form is to, to have face-to-face connection, uh, or I should say video connection. And the other option is just a phone call. And they were both reimbursed. So that was great. We honestly didn't at my previous workplace uh we didn't we still allowed everybody who wanted to be seen we we let them in the office there were obviously procedures they had to wear a mask and so on um but there were there were people who had uh, pros- um infusions they sometimes chose especially something like prolia injections which is for osteoporosis or reclass mm-hmm. those would be delayed and we actually saw some um fractures as a result of missed uh, prolia injection. So that was the bad aspect. So that people mm-hmm. who chose not to come to the office to get the procedure or to get the injection. Um, I think in general, um, insurance companies reimbursing video visits or, he- or telehealth visit was a huge step forward because we can apply it, we can apply it down the road. In my opinion, as I said, for the first visit, but also many times for follow-up, if patients are reporting symptoms that are not clearly, like you can make a full, um, fully informed decision on a video or, mm-hmm. or God forbid phone call where they don't even can, cannot connect by video. Mm-hmm. I think 
uh, physical exam still trumps the, you know, the video visit. So there are, there is time and place for a video visit or telephone visit conversation, but um, when there is a new problem or new patient, I think it's still better to examine in person. So I don't think the healthcare will go all telehealth <laughs> in the next five to 10 years. I think the main advance I, I imagine seeing is that we will have more testing, either blood testing or saliva testing that will help us determine which medications work best for like which patient we should, which medications we should go with because we will, and they will be probably gene-based um, or their particular inflammatory marker makeup, um, but it probably will be a combination of both inflammatory makeup in the blood and the gene makeup that will help us determine what medication is the best. I think that will be one advance in the next 50 years or 20. And another will be, I think our imaging will be like MRI one day, it will be cheaper right now, any body part like upward from $3,000, right? With the radiologist interpretation. And I think we'll be able to have office-based MRIs. And maybe I'm just dreaming, but basically I really think that's, that's eventually um, down the road. That's just my dream. And I don't remember what was the other part of the question. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the other part uh, I think you uh, alluded to was uh, what do you think the specialty would be in 10 to 20 years down the road? So as far as uh, human power, manpower, we are, rheumatology is um, understaffed. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough rheumatologists. There are areas where we have enough, like East Coast or Northeast or urban areas. And there are areas where we don't. So I, I do encourage people to go into rheumatology because if we don't, there will be even more shortage of rheumatologists and access to quality, high quality healthcare. Rheumatology care will be difficult. Um, yeah, so that, that I think that is a concern of mine, yes. Okay, uh, uh, so it seems like the job market will be uh, quite favorable for students if they chose to pursue it. I think so, 100%. Okay, okay, awesome. Um, and then um, one question I like to ask is, uh, do you work with uh, what they call mid-levels, MPs, PAs, and then how do you think their responsibilities change? Uh, a good question. So I worked um, alongside one in my previous workplace and mm -hmm. she was, um, my colleague was doing, like they had an agreement. She was um, intermittently reviewing some of her charts, but she was not directly supervising. She was very experienced. We are getting a PA mm -hmm. in the next uh, several months uh, because um, my colleagues decided that they needed to offload some of the patient load who that they didn't have enough space in their schedule for follow-ups. I personally think that we should have a rheumatologist join us. At the same time, uh, I just mentioned how there is a shortage of rheumatologists. So I think hiring a mid-level is a very wise step. And given how much um, training they had, I think it's always appropriate for them to be supervised by a physician, if not directly, meaning every patient, at least chart review or patient review at the end of the day. That's, mm -hmm. in my opinion, the best way how to ensure patient safety and uh, proper care. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. And then regarding job opportunities, other career paths you can do uh, uh, with rheumatology, or outside rheumatology, can you discuss those? Yeah, so I can't speak much for academia. I have some uh, academia-based friends on Facebook that I can connect you with. Um, but as far as um, rheumatologists, I just embraced doing something more or extra work in addition to being a rheumatologist. I am... Um, looking to do um, coaching for women with fibromyalgia. And I will be also engaged in a community and free lectures or free um, events for these women. So as a rheumatologist, uh, I feel I have so much more knowledge that I can share with uh, people who have our diseases to help them um, even without them having to come to the visit, I can share knowledge that can help them, you know, give them tips how to live better with whatever condition they have. And I think that's 
kind of uh, something for all of us to consider engaging in community-based events. Mm -hmm. As far as the coaching I'm trying to um, take on, that's um, been a, kind of a new field, I think, since pandemic that many people are uh, pursuing coaching. And um, I'm kind of still seeing where it's going to go. Um, I have not fully decided whether I can do it without having seen the patient first, but um, that's something I'm considering. So I guess I don't have a full answer for you yet there. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, it's okay. I think, uh, you know, everything is uh, it's a journey, a process. Uh, uh, that's true. For this. Um, uh, so, and hopefully there's some uh, learning and growth, uh, even if it doesn't come out as, as how you expect it to be. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, for sure. The learning and growth is so important. You're, yeah, you hit the nail on its head, like enjoying the journey, which is what's one of the advice I was going to give to the medical student to not stress too much about what's going to be like I, kind of going with the flow, uh, sitting with their, like if they don't know yet in medical school what they want to do, um, that's okay. They, they will eventually figure it out. And if I had option to do it all over again, I would... I would enjoy myself more. I would not wait to have fun or until I basically I was so strict with myself. I was I was studying so much. And we are here as humans for the experience and enjoying the experience, in my opinion, is part of like our life's journey. So that would be one advice I would give them to them. Uh, and then if they are into business or if they have any entrepreneurial bone in their body, I would say start pursuing that very early on. <laughs> <laughs> because learning about it 15 years into um, and medical school or residency will not teach you that. So mm -hmm. basically getting into courses on how to have other sources of income. There is a course for physicians. I, I forget how it's called. I think it's um, real estate investing or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not into that at all. I'm just saying yeah. people who have um, that kind of uh, inclination, they should start looking into it right after you know, as soon as they start their training. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, just like any other professions, I think we each have to treat ourselves as an entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, even when you have a contract as an employee, you have to treat yourself, to, hey, this is my own product, my own brand. And uh, what can I do to improve myself in that aspect or outside of that aspect? And Excellent and point, Dr. Kao. I I could not have said it better. And I wish I had that notion. I, I understand it now. And I wish I had that notion, you know, 15 years ago when I was starting. So yeah, if you can drill that into your uh, listeners head, like, yeah, I am name and CEO. Like I am the CEO of my own company. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And then, uh, so uh, you alluded to some of the top tips uh, to students. Any, any other tips that you wanted uh, to give to them? Um, no, I think we enjoying yourself to me is the being kind to ourselves um, on the journey. All of us mess up. All of us have failures and uh, failure is just an opportunity. I have understood that now in the past year, there is no such thing as a failure. There is just an opportunity to learn and to become better. And so being able to somehow enjoy that too and uh, taking it as a part of journey, I think that would be like, whoever is able to do that wins. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome, awesome, I hardly agree. And then uh, my uh, last question uh, is, uh, what are helpful additional resources uh, if students are interested in rheumatology? Oh, okay. Um, so American College of Rheumatology, I think does have a, like section for, when you go on a website, it does have a section for trainees. Mm -hmm. And um, there are always like volunteer opportunities, like American, I'm sorry, uh, Arsvadis Foundation, each chapter, like for each state has um, option for volunteers. And that would be a great way to get involved and get the foot in the door because when, then when they apply for jobs, they could say, oh, I already volunteered for Arsvadis Foundation here and they hear this event and mm -hmm. i think that can only add plus they can meet uh humans with real diseases in the real life with real lived in experience who can mm -hmm. show them and that that may change their mind and they may not go into rheumatology in the end or they may it may solidify yes this is what i want to do this is the type of patients i want to help mm. so 
Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you. And then uh, anything else you uh, like to add? Um, and we need rheumatologists. So I, <laughs> I would love if more people went into rheumatology fellowships. I think there is always uh, every year there are at least a few positions that are not filled. So I encourage, um, I encourage you to apply, uh, guys, because we need rheumatologists. Population is aging, and there are there are you know many conditions who are mostly in middle age to elderly, and we need more rheumatologists. So awesome. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Martina Zingebein, uh, for your time and uh, expertise in the, the field and giving us the advice on um, uh, regarding rheumatology. And uh, if there's nothing else uh, to add, uh, I'd like to conclude this uh, uh, this interview. Thank you again. No, thank you for having me. It was a privilege. All right. Uh, I'm going to end the recording.